much of our life in the pursuit of perfection. And we do so because we have this feeling that if we can get perfection out of our lives, we can live much better lives. And we also do that because we view imperfections as something that is negative. So we try to do everything we say, talk, very perfectly. But the reality is that imperfections are an integral part of our existence. So the question is, what if, instead of trying to eliminate the imperfections in our lives, if we can embrace some of them and convert them into strengths? So that then brings a bigger question. The bigger question is, has anybody ever even accomplished such a feat? Change some of their imperfections to strength? The short answer is yes, and that's why I'm here. And an example I would like to quote about that is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> I'm sure you all expected this example. But you know that he was born with an imperfection. He was born with a red nose that glowed brightly. And all the reindeers made fun of his nose. But on one Christmas Eve, it was extremely foggy. And you know the rest of the story. So the red nose of reindeer helped guide Santa's sleigh. So you see what happened here is the perceived imperfection of Rudolph actually turned out to be a strength which the other reindeer lacked. So this is one perspective of looking at imperfections. But you may say, well, Rudolph is a fictitious example. But the reality is that the same concept applies to us humans. And you're all humans here, and you will agree with me that we are full of imperfections, right? So how do we then convert some of these imperfections into our strengths? Take, for example, our human body. Our human body has this defect that the more care and comfort you provide it, the more unfulfilled desires and needs it finds. So that's imperfection, right? But nonetheless, there are many inspiring examples of personalities who have actually embraced their imperfections as strengths. And what we will see is that the same is true even in the world of materials. So when I talk about materials, I'm referring to things like iron, copper, gold, and silver. They too are like humans. They have a lot of imperfections. And if we can learn to control these imperfections, then we can bring strength to these materials. So almost about two decades ago, when I was a young researcher, I started working in the lab, and I strived hard to make a perfect material in the lab. An example of that is what you see on the screen. So the red dots represent the atoms. They're all similar kind of atoms, and they are in perfect registry. But more often what I would find is one atom would be missing maybe at the corner or maybe in the central region of this material. And many other times I would find that none of the atoms are missing, which is great, but it's a different kind of atom, which is represented by the green dot. So at this point, when I made this observation, I came to the realization that while a material can be perfect in only one and one way, which is at the top of the screen, it can be imperfect in many different ways. And which of these imperfections should the material embrace to become strong? That is a question to ponder about. And when you make such a discovery, what do you do? You drop everything else and study it, and that's precisely what I did. I started with very simple examples. For example, a piece of iron in the shape of a nail, iron nail, which the carpenters used to hold wood together. We all know that nail is made out of iron, and over a period of time, it rusts and corrodes. But if you add a little bit of nickel and chromium to it, it becomes rust-free. So it's just like the green dot on the screen. It adds strength to the iron nail, and the iron nail becomes rust-free. So defects can prevent corrosion. As another example, let's take this 
glittering diamond that you see on the screen, if you add a different kind of element, such as chromium and nickel, it can turn into a red diamond or a green diamond. And diamond itself is made out of carbon. So this philosophy and this idea has been perfected by the silicon industry. And silicon industry basically uses silicon as the material. And fortunately for silicon, to become powerful, it didn't have to look too far. So they just embraced their neighbors. They basically obeyed the great commandment, love thy neighbor. <laughs> so if you take a perfect silicon crystal as what you see on the screen here, the open blue circles are the silicon atoms, and the blue dots are the charge that flows around the silicon. They are called electrons. This is not as powerful as the one where one silicon is removed and you put a phosphorus in there. And this has a fancy name because it adds an extra charge to the material. It's called n-type silicon. And likewise, by embracing the next neighbor to silicon, which is the boron, you can create the p-type silicon. So both this n-type silicon and the p-type silicon are the building blocks for the semiconductor industry, which has allowed it to give us all the different gadgets that we enjoy. Take, for example, your cell phone. Your cell phone is very powerful solely because of the defects. With a touch of a button, you can trade stocks on Wall Street. With a touch of another button, you can tweet to the entire world. So defects are colorful, defects are powerful. And all this is fine, but at the same time, one came to the realization that for these devices to stay powerful, we also need to provide them with better batteries because your cell phone is powerful as long as there is charge in the battery that powers it. And most batteries, if you ever looked inside a battery, they have something called carbon. It's a black goo. And most widely present, uh, widely available form of carbon is what is called the graphite. It is present in the lead in your lead pencil. So if you take a lead pencil and on a piece of paper you write graphite, for example, as what you see on the screen, it leaves a lot of crumbs of carbon. And if you look under a high magnifying microscope, you will see that they are made out of chicken wire meshes that are flat. And these chicken wire meshes tend to stack on one another and they leave an open space. That open space, researchers call it as the gallery space. And if you look even closer, you will see that each mesh has a regular pattern of carbon atoms, which are represented with the blue dots. So this material has been called the wonder material, each of that mesh, because it is extremely light. You want light batteries. And it can conduct electricity better than any material that we have known. So it is, it is an ideal candidate to be used in future batteries. So what the battery technologists do is they look at the inner workings of a battery, which is what you see on the next slide. So basically, it has two metal plates. One, the yellow one is called the anode. The other one is called the cathode. And to prevent these two metal plates from shorting, we have a separator. The um, cathode has the material that provides the lithium, in the case of a lithium-ion battery. And the anode has this chicken wire meshes that are aligned as you see. So the battery technologists, when they look at this situation, they would prefer these meshes to be aligned perpendicular to the plate, as you see in this picture. And there's a good reason why, because when you plug your cell phone into the power outlet, lithium is ferried across the separator, and it is placed in this gallery space. And the more quickly you can do, the faster you can charge your battery. And the more amount of lithium you can put, the better the battery. So that's the name of the game. But unfortunately, when you go to prepare these electrodes, what happens is that these meshes tend to lie flat on the metal electrodes, as you see on the right-hand side image. And that causes a huge bottleneck for the lithium because they will have to find a tortuous path to get into the gallery space. So how do we solve this problem? And the answer may be obvious. 
you ask the mesh to embrace an imperfection. And in this case, the imperfection happens to be poking holes in these meshes. So when you poke holes into these meshes, it creates pores through which lithium can go in and out and occupy the gallery space. So this sort of technology is expected to really revolutionize our future batteries, and therefore, we love to call it the uh, technology of the future. And we do that by doping these meshes with a little bit of nitrogen, just like the silicon industry where you doped it with phosphorus or boron. Here, you happen to dope it with nitrogen. It opens natural pores like what you see there. And other, another way you could do is you could shoot atomic size bullets at it, which will then carve out holes of a specific size. So embracing imperfections by these two uh, the, um, meshes then makes channels for these ions to go in and out and lead to better batteries. So this approach has been dubbed as the holy grail for future batteries. <laughs> So I would like to leave you with one last thought. So the world of material science is exciting and mysterious. And it has taught me that some principles, such as embracing these imperfections, some principles are universal truths, regardless of whether it applies to materials or our personal lives. And for that reason, the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi teaches us to not only embrace imperfections, but to revere them. And some of you may have seen images of cracked pottery, where the cracks themselves are filled with gold. This is a way of teaching us to see the beauty in something where you would see it as broken. And I hope that all the examples that are presented to you will help me learn which of my imperfections I should work on and convert them into strength so that they will then define my uniqueness just as the red nose defined the uniqueness of Rudolph and made him special. Thank you.